So if you haven't seen our previous one, we did a Q&A with Scott, which was, I think, fun to listen to. And we have all of our videos, most of our videos, on podcast. What's our podcast called? <laughs> Scott and Kelly. <laughs> and it's linked below. <laughs> yeah, we'll link it below. It's on every platform. And it would be cool if you guys left us a review on Apple, uh, if you'd like, if you like the podcast. You had a first time experience last night. What happened last night? You wore mouth tape for the first oh. time. <laughs> yes, I did. What'd you think? It was, it was weird. My, um, it keeps your teeth together. Mm-hmm. Cause I thought it was to keep your lips together, which it does, but actually I kept my teeth together. Um, cause obviously usually I, I let my jaw drop a little bit. So I probably woke up at like four or five this morning and took it off. And then when I woke up again at six thirty, my mouth was dry. So it's a very interesting experience. Yeah. So I'm, I've been avoiding the mouth tape and. So I've been doing mouth tape for, well, I started it when we lived at our old house. So maybe almost a year mm -hmm. coming on. I just use the M3 tape that you can get from anywhere. There are like specialty brands of mouth tape, which I would be interested to try because the M3 tape does leave like residue on your mouth. And so I have to use my uh, rooibos infused jojoba oil to get it off in the morning. And that pretty much does a good job at getting it off. But uh, I've been using mouth tape because I sleep with my mouth open. And if you lay on your back, you sleep with your mouth open. But if you don't lay on your back, you're fine. But I obviously still open my mouth. That it true that it, your mouth was dried out mm -hmm. so it's supposed to be there's supposed to be so many really good benefits to sleep with your mouth shut and if you're unable to do that mouth tape is supposed to help with that so random side note all right so more questions i actually wrote them down last this time <laughs> last time i didn't have anything written down and we just kind of won it but i have some of your questions that you wrote down and number one was uh, lovely Miss Melody asked about, in our previous videos, we've talked about you, when you first came to America, were not able to work. And she wants to know why you weren't able to work. Yeah, the visa process you have to apply for. So I think as soon as we got married, we applied for a marriage. So you, what visa did you come on? Just a... B1? B1 business travel is it B1, B2? Something I like can't that. even remember the terminology. Remember, but it's like your, your usual 10-year travel and business visa, if you want to call it that. And then we got married, immediately applied for our spousal visa. Yes. And at the same time, I applied for a work visa mm -hmm. because your work visa comes quicker than a spousal visa, or at least it should. What was the immigration visa process like? Because that's yeah. something that a lot of people don't really have. We're not very good at admin. <laughs> <laughs> and no. so if we can do it, you know, praise anyone God. can do it. And we did not um, hire a lawyer to do no. it for us. So, well, we thought about it. We looked into it and the lawyer was going to be like thousands of dollars and we did not have thousands of dollars. So, and um, what you did have was time. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so I started like filtering through the whole website and all the PDFs of like all the different forms that you have to fill in and get in on time. And I think there was just this constant stress of like, did we fill it in? Right. Did it go to the right place? Well, did, you did. You don't hear back from them for like months at a time. So you did like all the work. You followed YouTube videos. Mm -hmm. Do you remember looking up YouTube? No, videos? but God bless. I was <laughs> some Delta who was just crushing at legal stuff, and I was like, "Thank you, sir." Yeah, I remember you did all the paperwork, and by the time I took it to FedEx to get it shipped, that was like a stack of paperwork this big, and we had to have someone sponsor you. Mm -hmm. So my dad volunteered to sponsor. Yeah. And a sponsor is someone who says like, "This person's not going to go on welfare." or be a criminal and I'm going to make sure that if they have hospital bills or if they end up in trouble, I'm the one who has to pay for them. So your dad very kindly did that for me. You cannot get a spousal visa without being sponsored, sponsored. by someone. Mm -hmm. And so we mailed it in and then I was concerned because January came along and that was when your six month visa had expired. Mm -hmm. I was just resting on one little screenshot of a sentence that said, once your application is in, it voids all other visas and you're not allowed to leave the country until you hear back from the consul, the home, what do you call it? The home, I can't remember. I can't remember any of these. Immigration services. Yes. Yeah. 
So you were petrified that I was going to get FBI in the middle of the night. <laughs> Whereas, yeah. like, I was like, I've got my screenshot. Yeah. So before you got approved, we had to go to Louisville. Well, first we had to go to Cincinnati and do your biometrics, weight, pictures, heights, all of that stuff. And then... When they finally did contact us, which I'm really grateful, this was all in 2017, and I think now, because of the corona stuff, everything's way backed up and mm -hmm. kind of a mess. So, we thought it took a long time then, Yeah. Um, but when they finally contacted us, then what was the next step? Yeah, then, um, then we went in for that interview um, where they took you into a room asked you a whole set of questions, wrote all your answers down. Then I went in and they asked me all those same questions, back checking it on Kelly's answers. Okay, this was a hilarious experience because every time we'd go to immigration, we like dressed very nice. Yeah, I wore my suit and you'd get there and there'd be like people in pajamas and hoodies all the time. And we were like, don't you respect this? Like, this is a huge moment. You're getting... They're deciding if you get approved or not. And half of them couldn't speak English either. Like, they had to have translators. And, and that's what took a lot you of time. You were the only person that spoke English in that whole waiting room. Mm -hmm. Everybody else had translators. Yeah. And that's what took so much time. Because if you were behind them, it would, like, everything had to be spoken twice. Two, two questions, two replies. Um, so it was very frustrating. But anyway, carry on. Okay. So then, then we had our... Uh, if you've seen the proposal with Sandra Bullock and Ryan Reynolds and they have that like interview thing that you've have you seen the proposal? Are you sure you haven't seen it? Never seen it. But it's where uh, this is the part of the interview where they take me and like ask me all the questions and like in the proposal I think they say like what color toothbrush do you have? So we were prepared for like all types all of the stupid questions. questions. Like but I feel like most of the questions had to do with our wedding and honeymoon and, honeymoon and I actually and the trip there and the trip to the consulate. Yeah. So like they asked us, what car did you come in? Who drove? How did you get like, which way did you come to get here? Yeah. And then they asked like, what each of us wore on our wedding day, how many guests we had. Where we went on our honeymoon, what we did. What we did on our honeymoon, and uh, when was our wedding date. Which I got wrong. Which... <laughs> <laughs> I, I couldn't remember. You couldn't remember I, anything. Well, not anything, but like girl details, like things that girls would remember. No, but like many questions you asked the interview. Well, I mean, lady. just for clarity, I was like, I'm going to tell you what I think, but I know my wife's one is correct and mine isn't. So you ask her what I said. <laughs> so this lady was like, not a happy lady. She was very serious, looked like she hated her job, and was very threatening looking. So Kelly I was, was cute enough to bring her whole photo album from the wedding and be like, oh, here's our wedding photos. And she's like, I don't care. Put it down. <laughs> I was like, okay. Uh, but we were really thankful that we didn't elope. We never considered eloping. But, but that would have been a problem. It would have been a problem because they wanted... Like letters from they wanted to make sure that there was enough people at our wedding that it was and legit. Those letters from your parents, letters from the couple who did our counseling. Yep, wedding cards. Uh -huh. So we had lots of evidence, evidence of our proof of marriage. So I really don't know how people fake it. Well, I I just have a feeling the system is so weak that they even even if it's bad, they just give the person the the thing. Yeah. So then. It was a few months after that, that you got your... Yeah, so I finally got my work permit first, is what, what came in the mail. Yeah. Um, and we had friends at church who were very generous to us, and, and I started working with a few of their businesses. And then probably took, like, what, another three or four months to get the spousal visa come through? Yes, and then that was a two-year mm -hmm. visa. A temporary one, yep. Because then I think that's the whole next thing is like it's temporary to see if the marriage lasts longer than two years and then they give the 10 year green card. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So after you got the visa, we were allowed to leave the country after yes. you got the spousal visa. That's right. Because you weren't allowed to leave the country during that process or it would start the whole process over again. After going through all of that, what are your thoughts on immigration? Wow. Deep question. <laughs> Well, 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 well. Immigration's a privilege, not a right. 
um, in libertarian thought, borders are unconstitutional or unrighteous or whatever. People should have free movement and it's only private property that people shouldn't be able to move to. Um, but I've come to the opposite conclusion of that where the commons, if you want to call it that, but the civic life, the, the political common, your neighborhood, right? Your neighborhood is a commons. You don't live isolated. You're not a cog that can just be uprooted and put somewhere else. Uh, you can't just build a wall around your house and be like, I don't care what happens to all my neighbors because my house is fine. Because it's not. Because if your neighbor decides to throw a party until 3 a.m., you hear the music. If your other neighbor decides to slaughter a goat uh, on their front lawn, you smell the guts. If, you know, whatever your neighbors do affects you. And so there's a far more biblical worldview on what a community is, what a nation or a people group is, and how we deal with boundaries and sovereignty of that people group and their culture. And so the modern worldview is that people are just cogs. They're not part of a culture. They're not, they don't really, they're just economic units that you can take from here and go and put there and it'll be just fine. In fact, it'll be better. It'll be strength. It'll be growth, all this kind of stuff. And that's not the truth. You know, there's so many uh, studies done on how taking people from different types of cultures and forcing them all into one neighborhood or one company or one area actually produces conflict and it produces low trust because people don't know how to live in a way that they expect someone else to just live. So like, for instance, with my brothers, uh, you know, we have this expectation of like, hey, here's how he's going to live. I know the decisions he's going to make. I'm not, I'm not shocked when my brother lives the way he lives because that's what I expect. But then you go and meet someone from Japan and you're shocked. Like, I have to bow every time I come into the room. He's angry that I didn't take your shoes off. Take my shoes off when house. I walked in. Like it produces low trust because well he hates me. The Japanese guy can say, Well Scott hates me because he he wore his shoes in my house and that's the most terrible, hateful thing. He hates me. Whereas I'm like, I just didn't know. And so that's the big problem we have with this global move mass movement of people, which is it's not a small thing of people just you know, 1% of people here or there joining a community. It's, it's engineered. It's massive. There's massive amounts of people groups being moved around into different cultures to sow low trust and conflict and a breakdown of certain nations. And it's only certain nations. It's not, it's not all nations. It's particularly Christian heritage nations. And so my opinion on immigration is that nations have a right to say we don't want immigrants and respectfully say no to immigration. Now all the libertarians and all the liberals would scream at that and just say how unhumane it is and how terrible. Um, but it's the nature of uh, sovereignty. You do not have cultural sovereignty uh, of your home. You do not have sovereignty of your home if anyone who wants to just come in and live in your home can just come in and live in your home. You have the right to lock your door you can have guests and those guests can come in and enjoy a meal and even stay the night in your bed and use your car if you, you allow them to. But they're your guests and so they must respect your rules of your home. Uh, and then they leave. It's a temporary thing. When someone comes into the house permanently, there was a, a great thread on Twitter from I think Foundation Father, but it's a great picture where this guy was saying how that guest then leaves. When a guest comes into your house permanently, the status changes from guest to spouse or from guest to adopted child. So the only way for a stranger to come into a house permanently must be for them to change status from guest to spouse or guest to child with the expectations of being part of this family and now the responsibilities of being part of this household. So a guest, often they just come in, they eat for free, they stay for free. It's a wonderful time. It's a party time when the guest is there. But if they had to come in and join the family full time, well, now there's work time. There's contribution time. There's you have to go out and bring in resources back. You have to deal with now new relationship dynamics. And so 
there has to be a understanding that the relationship has to change from guest temporary to permanent family. And so the only way that immigration really works in assimilating a different person from a different culture into the host culture is through intermarriage. So if a culture comes in, you know, 10,000, let's say 10,000 Japanese people move to South Africa. No, that's not a good example because South Africa is, it's not an, it's not a nation. It's a, it's an economic zone with many nations stuck in it. Uh, 10,000 Japanese move to China. The only way for those Japanese to become part of the family is to marry in to the Japanese culture. And then over three generations of intermarriage, they blend into that, that 10,000 can easily blend into that 1 billion over three generations of intermarriage. What about Japanese people into like Sweden? I, I think even after, if, if it's a small enough number and there's enough intermarriage, it might be more than three generations. But after three generations, those great grandchildren would be indistinguishable from the out, the outside culture that they left, the Japanese culture that they left. And if they assimilated, that's right. Into... That, that's what I'm saying into marriage into it because they they have to assimilate fully into the customs, the language. The these are my people now. I'm leaving my my land of my fathers and I'm joining this new land. And so the problem comes in when there is no intermarriage, there is no assimilation. And so you get these these people groups, 10,000, 100,000, 1 million, whatever it is, people groups moving into a country and starting an enclave. In other words, we're not going to marry in to this host nation. We're not going to learn the language. We're not going to obey the culture and the religion. We're going to keep to our own people. We're going to marry amongst our own people. And so three, four, five generations down in a nation, you now have citizens of that nation who are still separate from the host nation. And that creates low trust. It creates conflict. Um, and that's the, the genesis of the, the vast political problems we now see in all of these once Christian nations that were um, very honoring of their culture and their heritage. They now have 10, 20, 30 different cultures setting up enclaves and going for their own political power to go after their own interests rather than the interests of the host nation. And that's dishonorable. It's disrespectful. So then what would you say like to people who say that, well, you're an immigrant? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so I've married in, um, I've married into the host nation. I honor the host nation. So I'm not here. You know, there was a great story when we first went to Lexington in Kentucky, there's a huge South African community in Lexington. There was a huge Facebook group of South Africans, in Lexington and someone was like, Oh, do you want to be added to the Facebook group? And I was like, no, because the moment I get added to a group of three, 400 South Africans on Facebook, every Friday night, we're going to be brying with South Africans. I'm going to be talking like, like these South Africans. I'm going to be complaining about how stupid the Americans are and why they say this and why they do that. And you never assimilate because you stick to your own people. Whereas for me, it's like, I knew I was marrying into your culture. So to be honoring and to be respectful, I needed to honor the host nation and leave behind a lot of things that I thought would be incompatible with the life here. And it's likewise, if you came and lived with me in South Africa, you would have to leave behind a lot of things in order to fit in and assimilate there. Well, I was thinking about that with like the one time we were in South Africa for every time we go, but like when we were there stuck for Corona, I do feel like a major difference between South African or culture in South Africa and America is order and chaos. And when we go to South Africa, I can't expect order mm -hmm. and expect it's like blessed. I always say this in South Africa. It's like blessed are the flexible for they shall not be broken. But I think that is kind of like my version of assimilating yeah. more in South Africa. Yeah. Okay. I want you to tell this hilarious story. I was thinking about it when you were talking about um, people coming in. So, you may know this, but I had heard of it, but I didn't know how real it was until we were going through the immigration process and found out as soon as Scott wants to, to become an American citizen and he gets approved of that, he gets his citizenship, then anyone directly related to him... It's called chain migration, but anyone directly related to a U.S. citizen can get citizenship in America. Like immediately. They would have to go through the process, but they, would, they, they could immediately be go in through. the system. The funny story with chain migration is the one 
time we were coming back from South Africa and we were in uh, New York, one of the New York airports. And we were going through the green card, the American citizens or green cards line. And the international lines are always chaos because it's like four, it's two replies, two questions, two, because people need translators. They've got the wrong documents. It's always a shambles. Whereas the citizen line is actually usually pretty quick because yeah. it's straight in, welcome home. Here's the thing straight through. But this one time, which relates to the whole chain migration thing, uh, we were caught behind a group of about 10 Asian ladies yeah. whom none could speak English, but they all had American passports. Which shocked us. And so, well, I wasn't shocked. I uh, mean, it shocked me. My wife was shook. And so the TSA are very particular, God bless them. And these Asian ladies just couldn't follow instructions, were like hopping lines. Well, taking... so there's those one, blo- those poles with like the rope things that you can interchange. And there's this TSA lady who was trying to direct the flow of traffic. And the Asian ladies just snapped open the line and tried to cut everyone by cutting open the line. And this lady just screamed at them. And it was like they scurried back into this line. And then we get to the point. So we were, we were behind them. Yes, unfortunately. And so we get to the front eventually where like there's now the, all the booths where you present your thing and get stamped. And so it's like, one at a time, please come up. And this whole group just goes up. So the guy's like, one at a time. And they all jump back. And he's like, all right, one person. And they all come up. And he's like, one at a time. And they're all going. Over and over. Oh, my gosh. It was... And then the one lady did go. And then he's like, next. And then the next oh, rest of yeah. the group goes up. And we're like. Uh, so anyway. It works in our favor. Because by the time we got there, he's like, next. And we go like, greetings, officer. Like. I hope you're doing well. He's like, thank you. God bless. Welcome home. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he was over the yeah. chaos. I was over the chaos. Yeah. But that's just a symptom of how different people groups do things differently. You know, culture is not something that each different person is just a cog and they can fit into any other culture. People are different. Languages are different. Religions are different. Um, our heritage and our uh, idea of what it is to live a good life are all different and that's okay like praise god god made the nations god made the differences and the problem is with globalism is it's, it's making try, it's trying to erase those differences yeah we have a cross-cultural marriage but we are still like what, adjacent to adjacent groups, that's yeah. the word yeah we speak the same language we speak kind of we speak different dialects of the same language yeah. we have the same religion we have a very similar heritage and so it's easier for us than it is let's say a japanese and a zulu mm-hmm. who have different languages different heritages different religions and so even our marriage has been very hard not in the sense of like our marriage is on the rocks <laughs> and we're struggling it's like no like just we have to learn that this is how she grew up this is how she thinks, this is how I grew up, this is how I think. And because, like, I cannot imagine Kelly's childhood. Like, I've seen home videos, I've heard all the stories, and I'm like, wow, that's really nice. I can't imagine having grown up like that. And similar, Kelly's heard stories of my childhood and stories of how I grew up, and it's like, oh my gosh, like, she can't imagine growing up like that. And so now we are two people who have to now reconcile two different worldviews, two different ways of thinking about life. Um, And thank God we have the same language to talk about it (laughs) and we have the same religion uh, to deal with it. And a lot of the same values. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Um, But we do have, I guess that would be a lot of the same values. Yeah, yeah. But unfortunately, you know, for a lot of cross-cultural marriages, you're piling up difficulties if you don't have the same language, you don't have the same religion, you don't have the same heritage background, you don't have the same values, you're going to have a real struggle to perform the functions of marriage. So, you know, we have a great marriage, but the functions of marriage have taken us five, six, seven years to get to a place where we now feel we understand each other and yes. where where it's that intuitive, I understand what she's thinking about this thing right now, has taken a lot longer than it would be if we had both married someone from our own hometowns. hometowns. Yeah, exactly. So on that note, is there any other fun or just key differences of things that you noticed when you came into America? Besides like the culture shock that you experienced, just like the way America is different for you. The cheapness and overabundance of food. 
Hmm. I think in South Africa, soda fountains are not a thing. You buy one can of soda and that's your whole drink for the night. Or you have to buy another can once you finish that one. Whereas in America, you get this like huge big cup and you can just go up and fill it and fill it and fill refills. it. Refills. Yeah, you were shocked. I was about shocked. Refills. And I had to like ask for, for the first few times we ever went to restaurants or anything. I had to ask like, am I allowed to go? It's going to cost more money. Yeah, it's going to cost like, do I have to buy it again? <laughs> Um, and then same with portion sizes. I mean, food is just super abundant portion sizes, more than anyone needs. Selection too. Selection of things. Like milk. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Whatever product is in the store in South Africa, there might be two choices. Whereas in America, you go to the bread aisle and it's like the whole aisle is just bread or like the whole aisle is just milk choices. Woolworths in South Africa, I think must've been like a huge shock to you. Oh, I like love Woolworths. Yeah, but like how small. Oh, the... yes. But I think because I've been used to shopping like organic. Section, That's true. You've been in small little local grocery yeah, stores. Yeah, I don't really go to the middle parts That's of right. grocery stores anymore. Anything else that you can remember? Turning right at a, at a street light. In South Africa, you're not allowed to do that. And it's that's a great innovation. Uh, <laughs> saves a lot of time. Which would be turning left in South in Africa. South Africa. Yeah, we drive Was it hard side. for you adjusting to... Driving on the opposite side of the road. Yeah, I think so. There are a few intersections where I would just be very diligent to follow a car through the intersection if I was turning left, um, just to make sure I didn't go into the wrong lane or whatever. And there's been a few times. <laughs> I was just like, say the one time we got back from South Africa and we were staying at Kelly's parents' house, they just picked us up from the airport, and um, I was just going to take my car for us for a, a drive around because I hadn't obviously driven it for like three months or whatever and so your dad said oh i'll come with you so so i'm pulling out of the driveway of kelly's parents house onto the main busy main road and i'm driving driving for like i don't know two three seconds and your dad says uh scott <laughs> and i was like oh <laughs> so i'd pulled out onto the left side of the road yeah um, so you've done that a few times with me too i'm like wrong side yeah uh, but once you're in, you're in. I'd say it's only right when right you get when back. I come back. The other thing is cars in South Africa are all manuals, manual transmission. Cars in America are almost all automatics. Um, so that... And driving is totally different. How? You know how. No, I'm asking you. Everyone like, how specifically... like just passes oh, and yeah. like it's People, chaos. Yeah, in South Africa you pass. If someone's driving slow, you overtake them. It could be like a car coming, but it's like, oh, there's plenty of room on this road mm -hmm. for three cars to be going. I'll still pass this car while someone's coming at me because they can scooch over. Yeah. In most of the places in America where I've lived, if you're on a back road, two lane road, people will never pass. You could be going 30 admiring the cows in the posture <laughs> and someone will zoom up right behind you at like 60 and then like be like come on come on and it's like we're on a very straight country road you could overtake me at any moment but they won't <laughs> yeah yeah and in town in africa it's chaos like oh yeah yeah people don't wait for uh pedestrian crossings they don't wait they don't they actually just walk anywhere across the street at any time um, cars don't give way though, uh, whereas in America they do, which yeah, is a fascinating thing. Yeah, pedestrians don't have way. Because like, there have been times where people have been walking across the road and Kelly's like, you have to stop. And a school bus. I never knew about a school bus. That you have to stop with a school yeah. bus. Thankfully, I never did it. Or the funeral line. Oh my gosh, yes. I didn't know about that either. So in America, you have to, if a school bus stops to let a kid out, you have to, you can't pass. I think pass. it's most Americans watching this. Yeah, but I mean, that's a new, that's huge to me. <laughs> It's news to me. <laughs> like explaining the <laughs> if the school bus stops. <laughs> for the non-Americans watching. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. And same for a funeral procession. You have to like pull over so that the funeral procession can all... And then in South Africa, if there's an ambulance or a cop car, people will just follow the ambulance or cop car because it'll be quicker. <laughs> Whereas like in America, everyone like pulls the... <laughs> like get off the road. It's like... It can, it can pass me. I don't need to like go that far off, but like everyone's like, <laughs> get off the road <laughs> and like, okay, the, the things passed, you can get back on the road. Now it's like slowly get back on the road. It's so true. So law abiding, so orderly. I, I appreciate it. Yeah. Is there anything else? I think obviously there's all different dialects, you know, but it's the same in South Africa with different dialects. You just, every dialect, every region has their own dialect of English and so one of our lovely watchers said that uh, you've lost most of your accent since coming to America. So uh, one of the first, no, it would have been the second time we came. So 
got got our got my green card, worked for a bit, we went back to South Africa. When we came back, the first job I got that time back in, in America, that job was very phone heavy, intensive, where I had to make a lot of orders, I had to fix a lot of customer issues and problems and whatever. And I just got sick of people saying, What? We were in rural Kentucky, mm-hmm. so no one could understand you, unfortunately. Yeah, and so I ended up just being like, for the ease of this phone call, I'm going to put on my best Kentucky accent. Water, <laughs> three. You really emphasized the R's. But though. no one ever said, do what? They were like, uh-huh, yep, got, yep, yep. So you really, so the one time Scott was introducing me to someone he worked with, and how did you introduce me? It's my wife, Kelly. That's exactly how he said it, and I was like, <laughs> what did you just say? But Why did I, you say I it will like say that? I am I am a back country Kentucky whisperer. There was one guy who would come into the who would come into the business every so often and none of the ladies there could understand him. He was that country. He was so country they these Kentucky girls could not understand him. He was so country his hands were permanently stained black mm-hmm. from working on tractors. Sh- yeah, things like that. <laughs> but within about six months I was at about 80% fluency in his language. Him and I could have thick conversations. And then I'd have to turn to one of the ladies who worked for me and say, he would like this, 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 and this. And then she would say, okay. And then would tell me to tell him where to pick it up or what to do. It was... I was very proud of. You were so pleased. That's right. And then there was another time a lady that worked for Scott's name was Melinda. And he's so used <laughs> to saying... Putting I mean, an R on the end of everything. Of everything. So yeah. like water, you how would you say water? Water. No, in like South uh, Africa. Water. And then you put an R on it water. in America. So then with Melinda... Melinda! <laughs> he actually called her Melinda? What? Unfortunately, it was in front of Every- everybody. <laughs> And I was there too, praise uh, God. It was hilarious. <laughs> so she became Melinda from, from then, then on. From then on, Melinda. <laughs> Melinda. Uh, well, thankfully, since we've left Kentucky, your Kentucky accent well, has every time, gone away. Every time I go home, I get my accent back pretty quick. If I speak to my mom or my brothers, I get my accent back pretty quick. Yeah. It's just as soon as we hit American soil. Because I, it's, American it's a subconscious thing back. of like... I'm not going to have someone constantly say, what? Well, It's so very the first, annoying to me. Yeah. the first, I can understand that. Uh, I actually, someone once told me that people who don't change their accent uh, in the place that they're new, they said it's because they don't want to be understood. And so the fact that you do change your accent, it shows that you want to be understood. You want to, it's the whole assimilation thing. Uh, but... The one time, I unfortunately, we weren't together at this point, but when you came to America the first time and you went to a Dunkin' Donut to pick up donuts. That's right. And what did you say? Could I have a half dozen? And this lady just did not know. And I didn't know why she couldn't understand me. So, like, I just kept repeating, <laughs> half dozen. A half dozen. <laughs> and then I, like, pointed on the thing and she's like, oh, and then went and got me the thing. Six so donuts. I had to learn how to say half. Yeah. Half. Half. <laughs> so. Kelly can do a pretty good South African accent. I cannot do a South African accent. What it's would you cringe. S- what would you say? To- Why it's cringe? It's cute. It's really bad. Invite me for it. Invite me in for a drink. Okay. Um, would you like a cup of coffee? Very good. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's cringe. I So I think the South African accent is the hardest If you ever want to watch a baking show, it's on YouTube. This is totally side note, but if you like baking shows, this show, it shows South Africa. Actually, it's so South Africa. (laughs) The finale. (laughs) (laughs) The The confetti and the, like, whatever pops. (laughs) And, like, the guy ducks because he thinks there's a gunshot. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I thought he was kidding. It's not funny. But, That's great. But we were watched it over and over because the guy thought he was getting shot when he won because there was... <laughs> I was like, only in South Africa. And then at another point, the lady dropped the whole cake on the floor. And just put it back and on. And put yeah. it back on. And that's what the judges ate. <laughs> and she won that yeah. round. And I was like, only in South Africa. So it's called Tastemaster. 
uh, I mean, it's just a fun thing to watch if you're into baking shows, which I happen to be. If you like Great British Bake Off, it's like the janky version it, of... It'll show you the chaos of South Africa. It will. The chaos and low expectations. Exactly. That's right. We'll wrap this one up. Hopefully I ask all the questions that you guys wanted to know, and hopefully this was enjoyable. I feel like I could just continue on with asking We'll do a questions. part three eventually. Yeah, we could do a part three. Praise God.